Funky Politics. Hey, that's right, folks. It is the hardest hitting. We hit with a one-two punch and we will knock you out. That's right. The information we give you here is always entertaining and it's always educational, right? Speaking of educational, let's let's start out here, folks. COVID-19. COVID-19 in and of itself hasn't gone anywhere. As a matter of fact, the hospitalizations and the infection rates, and I can, let me just r- rattle off those states to you. Texas, California, uh, you've got Arizona, you've got Georgia, and you've got Florida. The numbers have increased exponentially. If you're traveling to those areas or if you live in those states, do us all a favor, but do yourself a favor. Make sure you observe social distancing. It matters. I promise you it matters. I was just recently in Florida uh, for a while with my family, and I can tell you this right now. Um, People that I was around, we were extremely aware of the social distancing. We wore our masks, and you need to wear your mask in the public sphere when you're out and about. Please do that, but also wash your damn hands. It matters, folks. It matters. We cannot see any more deaths in our country. I think it's 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 not a good look that the leadership is not um, the national leadership is really not taking this thing and uh, and running with it like like we'd like a quarterback to do. So that means you got all these governors that are different quarterbacks. Then you got some governors who apparently they're four string quarterbacks because they're doing a lousy job. Did I name those states by the way? Other than California. Lousy fourth string quarterbacks. Anyway, jumping away from that part, Black Lives Matter. Uh, the movement to eradicate police brutality on black and brown men and women in our country, it hasn't gone away. It appears that, you know, from what I've seen, that the protests, uh, the large scale protests that were happening in all of these major cities around the country, they have, um, they have um, I don't want to say wane, but they have kind of, I guess, uh, decreased a little bit, right? But what I'm told is that there is uh, other ways that they're working the system right now. For instance, when you're leaning on those corporations and you're saying to those corporations, we won't do business with you if you don't recognize that not only in your C-suite, but your management suite in your entry level suite, you don't have people of black and brown skin in those places, but you're dependent on that particular dollar. There are some countries, uh, excuse me, companies out there that are knocking it out the ballpark. One of the major companies out there is, is P&G, Procter & Gamble. They're doing a hell of a job. They are doing a hell of a job in trying to make sure that they that they are doing what it takes to make sure that our country is represented in their C-suite, in their own. That's all we're talking about, folks. It's equity. It's real equity. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm all the way with it. Hey, look, Black Lives Matter, let's do our thing. We are still protesting right for the right to protest, okay? And I think that is right. Speaking of uh, the protest, right? You got one protest. You've got to make sure you show up for November 3rd. November 3rd is extremely important in our country. It will be the federal elections and for some states, the state elections as well. But I will say this. If you are of the opinion that the country, and I've said this on this program a lot, that the country is running in a fashion that is pleasing to you, then you will vote for the incumbent. If you are one of those folks who believe, like a lot of us do, (laughs) that we're going in the wrong direction and there's a poll out right now, about 68% of the the country says that they believe that this country is going in the wrong direction. So (sighs) November 3rd is critical. Uh, The registration uh, for November is still open. Uh, Looks like there's going to be a lot of ability for people to do the mail-in ballots. If you are afraid, if you are 60 years of age, especially if you're 60 years of age, in most municipalities and states, you have the option of doing an absentee ballot. Make sure you ask for the absentee ballot if you're afraid to go to the polls because of the COVID scare, right? You have that right. Make sure that you talk to your local election officials about your opportunity to pull a absentee ballot. Enough about that. We'll talk about a lot more, about that more uh, in some more programs to come. But I want to get into I got an exciting, exciting guy on, on a program. there, a good brother out of Los Angeles, California. Daryl Miller is a partner with Fox Rothschilds LLP, a, a wonderful law firm, one of the greatest law firms we've got in our country. Uh, this brother is the chair of the Entertainment and Law Group. Uh, let me tell you something. He's done it all. University of Cincinnati, BFA. Uh, this brother has got his JD. Gr- I'm going to bring him on because, number one, we don't oftentimes get an opportunity to sit down with a um, with the industry leader who is representing clients uh, in the entertainment industry and abroad who can tell us, give us some insight on where the industry is going, number one, and uh, what we ought to be looking out for as we come forward. So 
you know what? Give me one second. I'm going to go get Daryl. We're going to bring him in. We're going to talk some funky politics in the entertainment industry. We're going to bring this brother all the way out of Los Angeles, California, right here today. Give me a second. I'll be I expect to go to Coachella in a helicopter. I want Coachella in a helicopter. Moroccan type. This is why we came to the Kazuki in that The next Beachella, they're going to drop yeah, us on the it, stage. Look. It's going to be like BNP sick. We're going to sell out under black people and yes. make me feel safe. It's amazing. Yes, 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 Absolutely yes, yes. amazing. Yes. We it's sell like, out with white people scary. It, it I know. Is. I feel like with the people here at Kazuki, and once we sell out, like they'll be the ones to be like, all right, y'all acting real light Simmer skin. Simmer down. Right y'all acting real light skin. Black nerd power on the Kazuki and Network. Hey, you got to check my folks out at Black Nerd Power. Hey, but right now I got Daryl Miller. Daryl, welcome yes. to Monkey Politics, brother. How are you? Very good. Good morning. Thank you, DC, brother. Hey, man, let me tell you something. It's, it's, it's not often that a little old guy like me get a chance to get such a, a huge, uh, a huge uh, figure as yourself on our program. But but thanks a lot, man, for joining us on Funky Politics on today. Don't to underestimate yourself, man. man. Well, hey, some hey, great hey. things with some great, great words and putting some great knowledge out there. So it's thanks, an honor. We, we try to do our part over here on Funky, but we're going we're gonna to entertain you, but we're going to educate you on top of that, too. And, and speaking of that, I want to jump right into this thing. You know, talk to our listeners about who Daryl Miller is, uh, our viewers, and, and give them an idea of, of, your, of your journey. I mean, University of Cincinnati was some time ago, but man, since then, you have put a lot between, as I tell people, uh, there's an asterisk when we're born, and we don't know when the exclamation point is, but it's down the road. But let's talk about since the asterisk. Right. I, I, I often say I feel like I've lived two lives because as a, as a young man, you know, growing up in Cincinnati, Midwest, um, I was very music oriented and I grew up in the hotbed of kind of the music of the 70s uh, that basically a lot of which came out of Ohio from Ohio players, you know, wow. to Collins to the Midnight Star to the Isley Brothers. That was kind of the world. And I was a drummer and then a singer uh, and uh, ended up going to a performing arts high school, the college conservator of music and then traveling around the world. So I had this whole successful artistic life. Uh, that was one half of my world that many people still remember. Uh, and then it really was literally, man, standing in India, uh, in Bombay, which is now Mumbai, standing on the shores, looking out about 20 years old, thinking the Lord has blessed this little you know, Midwestern kid from the streets of Cincinnati to the shores of India. He's got to have a lot more in store for me. Um, and I came back from that tour and thought about how can I leverage the success in my music career uh, and most you know think hey just get another job do an album and I literally thought how can I leverage it into a way that would be a sustainable business and I said you know um, add a law degree uh, and become a deal maker or at least an understanding uh, or have an understanding of those deals uh, thinking I would just kind of get the degree be a smarter performer and, and do my deals. but um, I, I, I uh, applied to 12 schools because uh, I thought everyone would think I was out of my mind. I thought everyone would think that um, performers should perform. Uh, I got into nine of the 12 schools, man, and then invited to be uh, come to Georgetown Law in D.C. Uh, and, and so in the fall of 87, uh, I was admitted one of 16 of every 16 applications one got in. I was one of 16 to be admitted into the fall class at Georgetown. And I'll tell you, man, as you say, life kind of takes off and from there became a, a whole nother side of my life, which you're seeing me now uh, that I have lived for 25 plus years now here in California, uh, practicing law, uh, being an advocate for artists, being an advocate for creators, being an advocate for my clients in general uh, in this world of entertainment and media. You, you know, Dale, I, I want to get back to more of some of the work that you've done a little bit later on. But I want to jump right into as you're talking about being an advocate. And, and we, we talked earlier in the opening about COVID-19. COVID-19 has really we, we've had to learn to accept it. I mean, there's just no doubt about it. You've got to we've learned to accept it. But, you know, but has the uh, industry itself, the entertainment industry itself, has it adjusted to this newfound world, this this new way of doing things? And, and, and how has it affected the performance ability during the living? 
Well, look, if you realize entertainment, for the most part, in most depressions, you know, people were still watching TV, sure. they were still listening to records to feel good, and they were still watching to go to a movie because it was still a cheaper form of entertainment. And when good times were rolling, people watched more TV, listened to sure. more records, and went to more movies. This pandemic has had a devastating effect on the entertainment business like no other thing in the history of our business. Remember, the last pandemic was 100 years ago. Yeah. 100 years ago, we didn't have the moving pictures. We didn't have the entertainment industry. So we have effectively dealt with something that has never uh, been dealt with before. And it, brought, it has brought, it continues to bring the entire industry to its knees. 100% of production in my business was shut down. 100%. Oh, 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 hold on. One, you say one, even in the restaurant business, 100% didn't get shut down. Uh, now, bars, I would say, you know, bars, maybe 100% of those, but this is the first I've heard that 100% of the entertainment industry was shut down. Production business. Production watch, yeah. We're in the business of producing content for people to see in the film and television world. And in that context, when social distancing came into play, right? What, what are movies? Yeah, yeah, whatever. The opposite of social distancing. Uh, when the idea of not knowing how bad it would spread or social contacting, everything, all productions pretty much ceased to happen. And we have yet to really go back into production. I think you've heard or may have heard that Atlanta uh, and some of the things, I think Tyler Perry was one of the first ones out announcing how he's going to slowly roll people back. I have a star of one of his shows that's now sitting in quarantine in Georgia who have yet to to be able to show up on the soundstage. Um, there are people just beginning to come back. Cal uh, LA is going through a lot of issues right now because we're still fighting, right? And you said it, I think, at the top of your show, we're one of the states that is still fighting with the rise in the numbers of, of, of people testing positive. So that's directly impacting production, and you don't have a lot of productions up and running around LA right now. We're all on the threshold of uh, getting into it, but man, we've gone from 100% of entertainment production for film and television business being shut down to trying to crawl back into it right now. Now, with that said, you know I believe entertainers and, and you know heard to say the show must go on. Sure. Uh, you've seen a lot of virtual shows, and you've seen a lot of things, a lot of creativity around people doing shows virtually from home, kind of beaming in and doing them through Zoom and things like that. You saw the BET Awards that was effectively done a couple of weeks ago, um, all kind of virtually and with performances on a soundstage. Much of that's all kind of happening. And, um, you know, we are all slowly rolling back in. But, yeah, we've gone from 100% down to maybe 2% uh, getting ready to go. So, so I'm going to look at it from this standpoint. If Hollywood, which has, to me, has the infrastructure for music, the infrastructure for moving pictures, as old folks say, moving pictures uh, for, for, for video and so forth, so the places like Atlanta, Nashville, Memphis even, who've had productions done in these cities, then we literally have the, the, the pneumonia because we don't have the, the infrastructure that, that L.A. has uh, for this industry. Will we recover quicker, though, but because we don't have as much invested in infrastructure than L.A.? I mean, you know, look, entertainment is a huge part of the industry in L.A. and the state of California in general. Um, but I think if you look at states like Georgia, you know, Memphis and others that have really attracted a number of productions and they don't, they don't just make dollars from our productions. They make a lot of ancillary dollars right. in the city around those productions, you know, depending on how big and how much that revenue is flowing in and out of those states, it can have a material impact on the bottom line. Um, I would imagine Georgia was racing to get back and build itself up because Georgia, you know, had become what New Orleans was before Katrina. I remember mm -hmm what's going on over there. So that was ultimately uh, amazing. You know, and you were just mentioning a second ago about the virtual space. And of course, you know, we're all operating in the virtual space now because it's difficult. Um, people still, and rightly so, have the, have the angst of meeting in person, right? Mm -hmm. the, but the entertainment industry has, to me, has kind of toyed with virtual shows before but they've always had live audiences so along those lines should the industry have probably pivoted earlier on than now having to do it right now and find some way of, of capitalizing on it or monetizing it rather 
You know, interestingly, even when we did virtual before, as you said, there was a lot of times live audiences, a way to kind of build in some, you know, the warmth of, you know, real people consuming it at that point. I think people were just startled into trying to figure out a new way to, to make content effective. And, um, you know, piping in, you know, audience applause and audience laughter kind of went out a few years ago, right? That very, uh, not attractive and really old school way of doing programming. So, yes, I think Hollywood, you know, should have pivoted. But remember, even before the pandemic, Hollywood has been pivoting dramatically for the last 10, 15 years. I came to a town that was dominated still by broadcast networks. I came to a town that was dominated by major studio filmmaking and distribution of major studio films. In the last 15 years, we've gone from broadcast to cable, yeah. from cable to currently streamers, right? We've gone from the dominance of the broadcasters, I'm sorry, dominance of the studios on the big screen to now Tyler Perry and his little films competing, you know, with a Marvel franchise. So the business that I'm in has been dramatically pivoting um, the distribution platforms because of the evolution of the digital technology has just significantly changed the game on a day to day basis already. So we have been shifting and kind of learning new ways to attract and engage consumers all the time. You know, the other fun one I remember and I like to talk about is how, you know, again, you probably grew up, I grew up when Hollywood told us where to be. Yeah. What Time to be and how long we would be, right? We wanted to see that prime time TV show at eight o'clock for one hour, and we sit there and race home and set our lives around it. Or I often said, I remember some of my, my male friends who I, I jokingly loved those uh, soap operas, and you know, that all my children were called their kids, and they said, I gotta go home and see my kids. I remember they would set their school schedules around going to see their kids, you know. Um, and I laugh because the today, consumers tell Hollywood where I will be, how long I'll watch, and over what platform I'll watch, you know? And so we've gone from having to rush home to watch the TV at 8 o'clock to say, you know what, I'll check it out on my iPhone, I'll watch it in five-minute segments, and I'll download it when I want, or I'll watch the entire season this Saturday and know everything you've watched over the last three months. So it's a very, very different paradigm shift that we've gone through in Hollywood. You, you know, and, I, and I, I want to stay for just one second. I was getting ready to shift to, and I want to talk about your book. I want to talk about the 16-minute thing, and I, I promise I'm going to get to it. But but speaking of that new dynamic, you know, where did these Netflix and Hulus, all of a sudden now these folks have major studios, and they're producing content where back in the day when I grew up, Metro Golden Mayor and all those folks, they were doing the damn thing right there. I mean, that was, if you were going to do a movie, you did it on set. Then I'll send you a book. I mean, that's just where it happened. But now you've got who you got these folks. Where'd they come from all of a sudden? And so maybe that's a part of that paradigm shift, right? It's a, it's a huge part of the paradigm shift. And it is a huge part of the consumer driving mm -hmm. demand, right? Again, Hollywood was built on telling the consumer what the demand should be and basically hurting the consumer where Hollywood made their decisions. Uh, the consumers are now going, no, we want. We will tell you what's hot. We will tell you what we want to see. And you've got a bunch of players who are not saddled with the kind of old school ways in which content was made, i.e. all these streamers, Netflix and others, who are basically saying, we're now going to look at the consumer habits. We're going to look at the trends. We're going to look at the Twitters. We're going to look at the media interests of these various consumers and ultimately create content for them and deliver it to them where they say they want to be, a whole different way of approaching it. So, you know, with that said, you no know, technology has allowed these new players to come up. You know, if you get, going back on a little bit of history, many might remember that Netflix was the functional equivalent of Redbox. You know, they yes. <laughs> started out, you know, just renting other people's content, right? You know, just kind of renting other people's content. You know, you're watching it, you kind of turn it back in, and you go away. Um, well, I think. Again, as others started realizing, wait a minute, this little upstart is aggregating more eyeballs and generating millions of dollars of subscriber funds on our content. Maybe we should be in that game. And uh, I believe that's what started the wars to say, if they can do it, we can do it. And so you see Disney come together and say, we're going to do our own version of a Netflix but we're going to make it family driven. We're going to gobble up these massive franchises like the Marvel franchise, the Star Wars franchise, and we're going to basically have a corner on the block and still charge a subscription and make another bucket load of money. 
uh, because now we're going to compete. And then Turner and Warner Media says, hey, we got HBO, we got Turner, we got all these other things. Let's create our own little thing called HBO Max, and we can create our own version of it. Then, you know, NBC says, we can start this thing called Peacock, and we're going to outdo them because we're going to offer it for free. You know, CBS says we're going to start an all access CBS, so all the library that we have, all the new stuff that we have, you guys can get it. Um, it really, I think, started at the Netflix level where they basically proved the concept that subscribers and consumers would actually pay for a subscription for real time, you know, on demand, you know, content. Uh, in a in a very powerful way, and that's that's what you see now. You see the the war and the race to be the next hot platform for streaming. Wow, man, you you're blowing my mind here. You you're blowing my mind. You you are a wealth of knowledge, Daryl. But I, I want to get into something that I know that you had a lot of passion about doing, and that's the 16 minute of fame. Most of us have had our 15 minutes of fame. I had 13, and it was all hell. But now <laughs> I'm gonna, so so I'm good. Let's talk about the 16 minute of fame, and then after that, I definitely need to get into this piece about uh, this article that you and, and Derek uh, Johnson wrote uh, with regard to uh, Variety, the, the article you wrote on Variety. So, so let, let's hit that 16-minute 16 16 minute of fame. What is that, man? What, what, what galvanized you to say, I've got to put this in right? You know, when I came to this town, remember I had a background as an artist. Sure. And as an artist, yeah, I feel like I was blessed to have, you know, saw a vision to kind of leverage it into something more. When I got into that something more, which I thought was I'm doing lawyer, I was a lawyer and doing the, the legal side of the business, I started seeing more artists and more people experience their 15 minutes of fame, that proverbial fame that Andy Warhol talked about. But I also more frequently saw people not prepared for what happened after that 15 minutes of fame. And so, you know, we all have opened, you know, you can Google, you know, uh, anywhere from NFL or a bunch of stars of yesterday, and you kind of, where are they now? What happened? You constantly hear stories. I'll never forget the story of Red Fox that moved me uh, really uh, in, when I got to town. And Red Fox, you know, San Francisco was hot for all of us. We all grew up in San Francisco. They still play. Man. From St. Louis, you know, Doc, from St. Louis. <laughs> so when I realized, and I got to California, I realized, you know, Red Fox died. He had a heart attack on a soundstage trying to recreate the success of Sanford Son because he had sold all of his future revenues and all of his back-end participation in that franchise. And so his 15 minutes of fame came up. Someone came along and said, hey, I'll give you a short check for all the future revenues tied to that show. Somebody advised him to take that check and my man had a lot of financial trouble from that point on. And so I, that, that story moved me. Sammy Davis Jr. moved me because he was one of the Rat Pack. I mean, an African American brother that was hanging with Peter Lawford and said, you know, Frank Sinatra. And, you know, those guys passed away, and their kids and their families had, you know, million in some cases billion dollar estates. Sammy Davis Jr. died, and his wife got a seven million dollar probate bill from, you know, from the Internal Revenue Service. And it just moved me that there was this pattern of rags to riches, back to rags, that 15 minutes of fame that we all strive to get uh, and, and, and many people not being prepared to what's after it. So I started not just seeing the high profile people, I just started seeing actors, writers. You've heard the stories about the NFL, right? At any given point, two years after playing professionally, 60, 70, 80% of them are on bankruptcy or you know financial hardship. And that moved me in a way to try to find a way to give some anecdotal information to what I call first generation success or people who are in their 15 minutes of fame who may not be prepared or understand what's going to happen afterwards. So I had this little anecdote and I basically said, you know, it's not the 15 minute of fame or the 15 minutes of fame we should be all focused on. We should be focused on the 16th minute and beyond. And so the the title of my book became The 16th Minute of Fame. And, this, and the real subplot is, are you ready for the 16th minute of fame? Or are you going to be another one of those rags to riches to rags stories that perpetually happen because we're not mentally prepared for the success that we seek? You know, and, and staying right there, and I, I, we're going to get to variety, but I want to stay right there because what you said about Fred Sanford and, 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 and also Sammy Davis, all of us, I mean, these were our brothers. I mean, like you said, I grew up having to get home to watch Sanford and Son. That was a part of what I did. And just to think that 
he died, as you just said, trying to get that mojo back, so to speak, right? So he could make some more money. It 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 just I, I don't know. Is is there a disconnect between the success and then the acceptance of that I have responsibility, Daryl? Is that what it is? I think there's a disconnect with what it's really like to be 50,000 feet above the ground, right? We all know it's really high. We've all heard the oxygen is thin. We all heard we need to prepare. But I really think we spend so much time rehearsing, practicing, preparing to be somebody. We don't really understand what it is to be that person day to day and to understand the kind of pressures that come on you and the kind of choices you have to make, the kind of people you need around you. In my book, I talk about, you know, if I gave you $10 million, what are the first five phone calls you would make? Right? Just the test, right? Now, anecdotally, we know that first $10 million goes to a jeweler, goes to a car dealer, <laughs> goes to a party planner, and goes to, you know, and so if, you know, if those are your first five phone calls, not the tax preparer, not the, you know, financial advisor, not the people that help you understand how to manage it and grow on it, You've already got a fundamental problem if you don't even know the first five phone calls to make when you come into your minutes of fame. Most people wake up in the 13th or 14th minute. I can't tell you how many people walked in my door on their 15th minute going, I'm now ready to try to do something different when they realize that minute is the end of that fame. And so if I can touch and just help people adjust their psychology and think about how in that first minute, you know what that first minute looks like when you're riding high, but if you spend a little bit of effort planning and just trying to make sure that you want to sustain that success and not just enjoy it for the moments that are there, um, I think it'll help a lot lot of people really understand the battle isn't about becoming successful. The battle is really to stay successful. And so the 16th minute of fame is designed to help people kind of adjust that mentality to really understand and approach fame in a very different way. Where can our listeners and viewers get this book? I mean, it sounds like something that we need to have in our arsenal, especially just as a gift. We talk about giving Christmas gifts and birthday gifts. Do we ever give a gift of knowledge to people, right? Not just a, 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 a car or a diamond or something, but, but something like what you, what you had the time to pin Daryl, makes sense to me because it's free advice. Number one, I don't know a lawyer in town is going to give you free advice. Not much <laughs> longer, right? So, I mean, where, where can I get this book? Where can I get it? You can get it on Amazon. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive. I made it only about 172 pages. I made it a small book. I made it easy, digestible to read. Um, I didn't want some big, gigantic treatise because I wanted people in the height of their success, in the height of their moments. I wanted the smartest to the not so smart to feel comfortable with picking up this book, I tell a little bit about my story, where I came from, so I want to give you some context. I don't want you to think I, I grew up with a you know, silver spoon or a wealthy family. I struggled and put myself through school and did a number of things. I want you to know me. So the context of the book, it really is um, it's about giving people you know, some, some inspiration uh, to think about how to win in this game that can be very, very, very successful and lucrative, but can also be very, very devastating. It is an, it's a wild uh, dichotomy between the heights, the highs, and the lows of the sports and entertainment world. Um, and so you can get it on Amazon. Uh, and, uh, and then very soon I'm going to be out trying to do a few little master classes and, and kind of taking my act on the road. Uh, because that's one of the things I love doing as well. I continue. That's the performer in me still looking to want to uh, and yeah, engage with people and ultimately uh, continue to help people. Well, well and, and, and continuing to help people, I, I know uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, the movement in and of itself, uh, are surrounded about, about this uh, police brutality piece uh, that we've all been fighting for years and years and years and years. And there was a story in 92, even in your, your town, L.A., where you had Rodney King, which probably should have opened our eyes then. I tell people Emmett Till should have opened eyes then. Uh, uh, the, Dahmer down in Mississippi should have opened eyes in. I'm not so sure our eyes are yet even open now, but you and Derek Johnson, uh, president of the NAACP, you all wrote an article, you you co-authored an article in Variety. Let's talk a little bit about that that systemic racism in the industry. Yeah, well, we co, we did an op-ed, a guest op-ed that was entitled, you know, Hollywood must not settle uh, for the comfortable response to systemic racism. Um, And 
the point of it was just kind of to add some voice and to add some context, you know, to this debate that's happening. I do think it's a little different today than it has been in the past. And you're, you're so right. In the past, you know, we should have had our eyes open with a number of events that have occurred. But I think, you know, watching a brother for eight minutes and 46 seconds have life drained from him on broadcast television with the world to watch as if we were back in the Coliseum time watching the gladiator kill someone, um, I think jolted the consciousness of America in a way that only certain things historically have ever done, right? I often say slavery at some point, the consciousness of America, which led to the Civil War. You know, the civil rights legislation, when the, when the moving picture really came into the home in black and white and started showing those images of dogs barking and biting young, innocent, nonviolent protesters, the conscience of America woke up and basically said, enough is enough. I think George Floyd has reached that point where the conscience of America, not just black America, but America, you know, living under the ideas upon which the, the country was founded, have, you know, been awakened and shaken at this point to pull all people together to say enough is enough. And in the article, we basically, you know, tried to give Hollywood, and this was written for Hollywood, to basically say, you know, the comfortable response, or I call it the comfortable, comfortable give, is not enough. What is a comfortable give? You know, I'm sorry, right? That's a comfortable give. What is a comfortable give? A big fat check. Don't stop writing the checks. But it is easy to say I wrote a check, and but I didn't reach out and speak to someone. We so we gave a little overview of what we think is not enough to kind of change and to address this moment in time. And we actually gave concrete, specific steps that we feel Hollywood, you know, the major players from the boardrooms and the C suites all the way down to the director's chairs can, can, can uh, do in order to kind of help really begin to make some change this time when we should have had change made, you know, in the past. Sure. Well, you know, the, we, we are out of time. <laughs> Man, you are a wealth of knowledge. I got to get you back on Funky Politics at some <laughs> point because there's so much we didn't cover. Uh, but, but I tell you what, the, the work you're doing in L.A., I mean, the work you're doing around the country because you're a voice. And, and I understand that we've got a lot of leaders, but then do we have those leaders who are stepping up and they're using that platform that they have to aff affect change? And I'm here to tell you in the conversation that we've had today and what I've read about you, I believe you're one of those leaders who are actually making a, a tangible difference in the lives of black and brown people and other Americans in our country. And we say thank you for that. Well, thank you, man. It's, um, I'll tell you, it's just, I, I do it with a huge amount of humility and, uh, and purpose uh, and understanding. I've never believed that my success alone is enough. Wow. Um, it was always for me, you know, when I got to the town, there was one or two successful people of color. And I questioned whether or not they were successful because they felt they were only one or two that could do it. Uh, I, I early on never subscribed to that theory. My success only comes from the strength of those around me who connect with me and, and with whom I connect. And, uh, and if I don't have a village of people who will actually make sure I'm their advocate, I don't think you know, uh, uh, my success goes as far. But I've been blessed to have clients that I have invested in for a long time, relationships that I have invested in for a long time. You know, my advocacy and my ability to kind of pull people into this game and give them access to things that they never would have had that's been just a pattern and an instinctive way that I have lived for a long time. And so um, that's just my way of doing it. And I'm, I'm honored and, and happy to, uh, to continue to see that, you know, through. Hey folks, Daryl Miller, um, noted, notable, notable entertainment lawyer, uh, based in LA, but he's, he's a man of the world. Uh, if you need some real good representation, and you got some money, no, it ain't free advice, right? <laughs> but the brother is out there. Daryl, let us know when you start that speaking engagement. I mean, we, we don't know what it's going to look like in terms of uh, uh, being able to, to do large events anymore, other than the president. He does them anyway. He doesn't really care. But, but when you have that opportunity, please let us know on Funky Politics so we can be a part of it in some kind of way to make sure we're helping to amplify your voice, man. Thanks again for being on Funky Politics with us. Thank you for the invitation. Great, great opportunity. Thank you. All right. I'll be back right uh, I'll be back with some closing thoughts. Give me just a second. It's the pride that makes you feel that you belong. It's the pride that makes you feel that you belong.
Funky Politics. R&R on Sports. Brother Rashad McCants, welcome to R&R on Sports. Thanks for having me, brother. It's R&R on Sports. I've got some closing thoughts on today's show. Uh, Daryl Miller, there's no doubt the advocacy and the work he's doing in our community is going to help elevate us and hopefully elevate the masses. You know, when that bottom rises, guys, the whole thing's got to rise. That's just how it works in our in our in our world. Uh, and I was told by my grandmother one time. She said, "Son, every tub has a stand on its own bottom." And so I want you all to understand that we're going to get through this COVID nineteen piece. We are going to see a brighter day. Uh, I was talking to my cousin Darwin Henderson. We were in Florida together, and he brought he brought something to my attention. He said reparations. He said, "Man, we need to be talking about reparations." And I promised him. I said, "You know what? I'm going to use my platform. We're going to talk about reparations in some shows to come." Uh, but I want to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves right now, especially in this COVID nineteen piece. Wash your hands. Socially distance. Wear your mask in public. But Black lives still matter. They will always matter, and they always matter to me. Stay safe out there, and let's do what we got to do. I'll see you back here with more Funky Politics on another time. I'm out. Funky Politics, recorded at Kitsukian Studios. Directed, produced, and distributed by Kitsukian. Kitsukian.